from the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta, welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. I'm Senior Pastor Tony Sundermeyer, and I want to thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. And I would invite you now to join us in the worship of God. Friends, good morning. good morning. My name is Tony Sundermeyer, one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. Let me welcome you to this final hour of worship on this Lord's Day and this Easter tide season where we continue to remember and celebrate that Christ is alive. He is with us and for us even now as we gather for worship. A special welcome to those of you who are with us for the first time, whether you're visiting from out of town or whether you live in town and you're here with us, or if you're somewhere around the world. Uh, live streaming. We're glad that you've chosen to be with us in worship this morning. Before we begin our time of worship, I'm going to invite you to stand, to move about the sanctuary, find a face you don't recognize. Let's say good morning and welcome. Sarah, how are you? Good morning. Good to see you. Please turn in your pew Bibles to Psalm 23, which is found on page 474 of the Old Testament. Listen to God's word. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in right paths, for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Our second text for this morning also comes from the lectionary, and it's not surprising that these two texts go together. From the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, verses 11 through 18. You can follow along as I read aloud on page 97 of the Pew Bible. Continue to listen to God's word to you and to me. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, break open your word afresh to us this morning so that we would be different people than those who came into this sacred space, even to be more like your son, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, shepherd and pastoral imagery is a constant in the Bible. From the book of Genesis, where Jacob confesses God to be the shepherd of his life, 
from that opening book all the way to the book of Revelation where the writer talks about Jesus not only as being the Lamb of God, but being the shepherd who leads us to springs of everlasting life. The one who wipes every tear from our eyes. From beginning to end and everything throughout, all the books throughout the scriptures, we find over and over again this image of God, this image of Jesus as shepherd. Perhaps the most famous usage of this image comes from the text that A.J. read for us this morning from Psalm 23, penned by King David, the king of Israel, who he himself was a literal shepherd and a figurative one as he is the monarch of the, the people of God. As he shepherds the people, he writes these words, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want Those words and the words that follow have brought comfort and healing and hope to countless people who have found themselves walking through the valley of the shadow of death. One thing we ought to note is that the application of shepherd imagery to God or to the gods or to human rulers, it was not all unusual to apply this image to those people in the ancient world, from the Hebrews to the Greeks to the Babylonians, framing the mission of a ruler or or framing the mission of a king or, or framing the mission of the gods as one who shepherds or as one who pastors the people of their particular tribe was very, very common. So for Jesus to apply this imagery to himself... To call himself the good shepherd, it wouldn't have been all that odd for those who were listening to him. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. So if you're a first century listener, you're thinking, okay, Jesus, I'm tracking you here. I get it. You're our rabbi. We are your sheep. You are guiding us. You are protecting us. You are nurturing us. This imagery of a shepherd and and sheep applied to communities and their leaders, it was very accessible for people in the first century. We understand what he means when he says that he is the shepherd of his own flock. But then Jesus moves on to say something that is a bit more unexpected. He says this, and it's in verse 16. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So you're tracking Jesus thus far if you're in the first century until he gets to this place and you may have turned to a friend and said, wait a minute, what did he just say? There are other sheep that are going to be a part of our flock? On the outside, ones who are outside the current fold? What is Jesus talking about here? So let's unpack this a bit. A shepherd was charged to tend a specific flock of sheep. And presumably, the shepherd had a very defined area or or plot of land where those sheep could roam around and eat grass all day. If we expand the application of this imagery to the rulers of the day, if they were described to be a shepherd, they are once considered to be the shepherd of a distinct group of people that live within well-defined geographic boundaries. So the ruler as shepherd tends to their own flock. In other words, they tend to their own citizens, their own people, their own cultural group that live within the boundaries where their power is legitimized. I have a colleague on staff here who is fond of the saying, stay on your own ranch. Now, literally, I had never heard that phrase until I heard her use it. And I wanted to know, I liked it so much, uh, I wanted to know what exactly, what other context, rather, that you could use that in. She said, well, well, you could have a family member who is, is sort of sticking their nose into someone else's business. And you can say, stay on your ranch. 
Or there's somebody in your life that is trying to be helpful, trying to give you some free advice, trying to lend you their two cents, and you can be very kind to them. You can say, thank you, but, but I got this. Stay on your ranch. So shepherds are supposed to stay on their ranch. They stay on their own pasture. Shepherds tend to their own sheep and let other sheep on other ranches alone. But not Jesus. Jesus says that he has other sheep from other flocks that he is going to bring into his fold. These sheep are not currently under his authority. What is more, these sheep are on someone else's ranch, presumably listening to someone else's voice. But it doesn't matter to Jesus. There are sheep outside of the fold that he wants to bring in. He will call them by name, and they too will listen to his voice. Many scholars and theologians have taken this saying from verse 16 to mean that Jesus will call for himself other sheep outside the flock of Israel, and that makes sense. As it appears, Jesus is talking about his mission to the Gentiles, a mission that he inaugurates and then we see come into full view in the book of Acts as, as Paul begins his ministry and as the church grows throughout the world. It's not just the, the Jews who are receiving this good news, but it's all people of all kinds from all nations who are being brought to God through Christ. But remember that these Gentiles were deemed by many in the house of Israel to be outside the fold. These Gentiles are grazing in the wrong place. They're not part of our flock. They're not the right kind of sheep. They don't belong to us. But Jesus, it appears, is ready to call them to. And one of the big ideas of this text, maybe the biggest idea of this text, is that Jesus will call whomever he wants to call. It's not up to the sheep. It's up to the good shepherd. And that is perhaps why Jesus is called the good shepherd. For he is good because he will call and lay down his life for sheep, both deemed to be inside the fold, but also outside the fold. And that's part of what makes him so very Good. He shows a compassion for those outside the fold, and by doing so, he redefines who ought to be included. So, of course, it stands to reason, then, if Jesus is that kind of shepherd, if he is, in fact, a good shepherd, then his flock should expect, should expect to graze with sheep from other flocks, should expect to share space with sheep from other pastures and other ranches. This is not just a theological idea that's nice to think about. This truth should be actualized. It should be embodied. It should be received by any community that calls itself Christian, that bears the name of Christ. Allow me to share a somewhat offbeat illustration uh, to illumine this point. A couple of Friday nights ago, our family of four, uh, we were all together and the calendar was wide open. We knew this was coming a few days before. We realized that nobody had anything on their schedule. And when that happens, we put a flag in the ground and we say, we're going to protect this night. It is family night. And so family night usually includes a fun dinner, maybe at home or out. We usually do a walk around the neighborhood as a family of four, and we'll make some popcorn and watch a movie in our living room. Just be together to protect that time. I decided earlier in the day that I was going to make homemade pizza on the big green egg. Uh, Luke, our 10-year-old, was going to help prepare the pizzas with me. And earlier in the day, I went to the store to buy some appropriate toppings. One pizza would consist of red onions and spinach and bacon with some fresh mozzarella cheese. Another pizza would be plain. A third and final pizza would consist of artichoke hearts, garlic, spinach, and cheese. And so I had all of the, the toppings lined out. I had the dough already. Luke was brushing it with olive oil. He was helping me put on the sauce and put on the toppings each in their place. We came to the plain cheese pizza and he said, Dad, I'd like to add a topping 
to half of this pizza. I said, sure, here are all the toppings right in front of you. He said, I don't want any of those toppings. He went to our pantry and he starts rooting around and I'm thinking, of course, he's not going to find any appropriate, acceptable toppings in the pantry. That's where we keep our cereal. That's where we keep all the candy and the snacks. That's where we keep the non-perishable food. All of a sudden, Luke says, I got it. And he pulls out a jar of Jelly Belly jelly beans from two Easter's ago. I said, Luke, you cannot put jelly beans on a pizza. He said, why not? I said, because they are outside the approved list of toppings that go on a pizza. He said, so what? He said, I, I'd like to have jelly beans on half of this pizza. So in my mind, I thought, you know, he's being creative. He's thinking outside the box. He's being like Jesus. He wants to include the jelly beans. <laughs> he wants to bring them in the fold. And, I, you know, I said, it's family night. Go for it, kid. So Luke placed the jelly belly jelly beans on one half of the pizza. I cooked all the pies. We sat down for dinner. And I plated two pieces of the cheese pizza topped with jelly beans in front of Luke. He said, Dad... I don't want this. I said, you, you wanted me to make a, a cheese pizza with, with, with jelly beans. He said, yes, I wanted to make it, but I didn't want to eat it. You know, it's one thing to think that jelly beans shouldn't be excluded from the list of acceptable toppings to go on a pizza. It's another thing altogether to actually eat the pizza with the jelly beans. Here's what I'm getting at. It's one thing to affirm that Jesus will call sheep outside the fold to listen to his voice, but it is a totally different thing to actually graze, to actually share space, share fellowship, share time, share ministry with other sheep. You see, any pasture or any ranch run by the good shepherd will have all kinds of sheep. Those who we have approved and those who we have disapproved of. There will be sheep that we expect and sheep that will surprise us. There will be sheep that look the same and sheep that look very different. There will be a diversity and plurality of sheep that listen to this one shepherd's voice. So why do so many Christians and so many churches fail to embody this truth? More specifically, why do so many Christians and so many churches fail to affirm that one, Jesus, the good shepherd, could be speaking to someone who they've perceived or who I have perceived to be outside the fold, and that two, those that hear the voice of Jesus may respond to him in a different way than I do. Why is that so hard? For the church, why is that so hard for Christians? Truth be told, I don't think our congregation has a hard time buying into this theological idea. I think we probably could find consensus in the room if I said, is this the kind of church, is this the kind of community that, that Christ wants to build? You, you would nod and, and say yes. I think in a more concrete way, when one chooses to participate in the community life of First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta, or one chooses to become a member of this particular church like our confirmands are doing next week and like a bunch of new members who are coming together for the on-ramp class are doing today, when we choose this church by God's grace, we are choosing an urban, midtown, politically purple economically inclusive, theologically diverse, outward-facing congregation that is equally challenging as it is charitable as we seek to hear the voice of our shepherd and follow him humbly in the world. We expect here at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta to worship with and serve with and pray with and think theologically with sheep of all kinds. But it is not easy work, and we are certainly far from perfect in it. But this is who we are. 
And this is who we are striving to be. And it stands to reason that not all people will want a church like this. Some people want a church that affirms the beliefs they already possess before they come into the sanctuary, before they darken the door. They don't want to be challenged. They just want to be affirmed. They want to be told that they're right. If their political or theological or ecclesiastical convictions are not affirmed, they're going to look somewhere else. But that's not the kind of church we're trying to be. Over the past 20 years, we as a congregation, in one way or another, have wrestled with what it means to choose each other instead of choosing sides because God shepherds all of us sheep. We have wrestled with what it means to have Christ at the center and we continue to wrestle what it means to collectively and humbly follow Jesus into the world. From time to time over the past 20 years, folks have left this church and we certainly grieve their departure because we believe that we are better together. Some have left because we haven't chosen sides, because we've left room for mystery, because we've left room for ambiguity, because we've left room to not make a decision in an immediate way and to see where the Spirit may lead us through various voices and convictions. As a church, we are going to be very measured and judicious and biblical and prayerful. And heck, we're Presbyterians, so we're going to lean into process as we seek to discern the Good Shepherd's voice. This Jesus who speaks to us and in a mysterious way speaks in different decibels and different tones to each one. Nonetheless, it is his voice that we will seek after. For he is the good shepherd. No one else. He is our good shepherd. His is the voice we must hear and obey. And so may we continue to be a church of many different sheep. And may we continue as individuals and as a whole listen for our shepherd's voice and have the courage to follow him wherever he calls us to go. Amen. I invite you to stand if you're able as we respond to God's word by affirming together what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Shepherd, the one who seeks us, loves us, stays with us through life on earth and life eternal, we come to you today with our deepest gratitude, grateful that you came to earth and conquered death in order to rescue all your sheep, to heal all who were injured, to feed all who hunger, to call into your service all who wander. We thank you for the wideness of your mercy, for the welcome that you extend to us without any limit, without any end. We thank you for the comfort you bring in our grief, for your commitment to hold us as your own, not only when we see you and hear you and turn easily toward you, but also when we can't find you when we feel the threatening presence of violence or sickness or want or fear, when we stray from your fold. God, continue to walk with us and to draw us close. 
Be with us when we know how desperately we need you and when we start to believe that we're doing just fine on our own. Be with us as we try to understand everything that is beyond our logic or reason, as we wrestle clinging to your word, as we try to teach our children to love you, and as we try to be good neighbors to the sisters and brothers we have as members of your beautiful household. Lord, we ask all these things in faith that you are, as you always have been, our good shepherd, the one who knows us and calls us and invites us to know and to love those you invite in. Hear our prayers today as we say together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God has blessed us beyond what we can see or understand. As we rededicate our lives to God, let us also return our tithes and offerings with joy to God's service.